Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today. This will be a concise 20-minute webinar, and it's all about lead generation. With that, a little bit about our technology. You can click the black X if you wanted to close out, but you should use the arrow to, shut, to open and shut the screen. Your lines are muted for the duration of the webinar, and you can enter questions at any time. Don't click the black X, though, unless you want to leave. Now, about our speakers. My name is Alan Bloom. I'm the CEO of Startup Selling. I've authored two books, Your Virtual Success and Sell More and Work Less, which is somewhat topical for our discussion today. I've been on the Inc. 500 list twice, and I've authored about 100 marketing articles about uh, lead generation and web marketing. Our speaker, our featured speaker today is actually John Scranton, and the reason he's a great speaker is he lives, eats, and breathes this particular topic. He actually lives and uses all of the systems and methodologies that we're going to discuss today. He's a licensed agent, co-author of Sell More and Work Less, has worked for a top 100 insurance agency firm in New York, and is also, as you folks probably know, a prolific blogger. With that, John, let's talk about our webinar today. We're going to be talking about prospect profiling, lead handling. That's a key aspect of this web seminar today. Appointment setting, your elevator pitch to get those appointments, e-marketing, and we'll have a Q&A session. With that, John, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alan, and we're very excited about this web seminar today because just like Alan said, this is what we do. This is what I live and breathe every day. It's what I did when I was an agent before coming to Startup Selling. It's what I do today, and it's what we help our clients with on a daily basis, and we really enjoy it. So our top five tips or strategies or ideas for successful lead gen in 2013 starts off with, number one, identifying your suspects. It sounds simple, but it's critically important. Every agency exec, every producer, everybody, even the CSRs, should be able to accurately describe in minute detail who your ideal prospects and ideal clients would be. It has to include all the demographic info, industry, size, location, but should also include information like their current relationships with brokers or maybe even carriers. How do they quote? How do they buy? And how do all these items together make them a great prospect in profile or a poor suspect out of profile? It's also important to formalize this process. It's a great whiteboard exercise to put producers in a room and have them talk about the different prospect profiles for commercial accounts, benefits accounts, uh, maybe even personal lines accounts. However, you need to bring that information together in something formalized like a prospect scorecard which removes any emotion or feeling from your identification process and quantifies that into a numeric value. We'll show you an example. This is a scorecard we actually created for a client of ours. Um, if you want to see more about the Prospect Scorecard, go to prospectscorecard.com. You can download um, an Excel version of a scorecard that you can use and work with, or there's a link to our iPhone app, which I think costs a dollar or something like that if you're interested in that. But what's important about this graphic on the screen is that we've come up with 10 prospect attributes that when in play make a prospect in profile versus those outside or on the periphery of a profile. In this case, our client wanted to work with accounts that were big but not huge. So 50 plus employees, at least 5 million in revenues, but not typically over 50 million in revenues because they didn't want to go into the Marsh Aon area. They wanted to be in the upper mid-size accounts. They wanted to stay at home. New York and New Jersey, they did better. They wanted to be in certain target industry verticals, and they wanted to find accounts who needed help with the type of safety challenges that they were very good at assisting clients with. So as you can see, the first couple prospects in this scorecard got check marks, or ones in this case, for all of those fields, as well as the buying-centric fields, like are they open to new change, or do they have a centralized decision-making model, meaning less rungs of the ladder to climb? Have they worked with them before? And you can see accounts that scored 7, 8, 9, 10, they typically closed. These people were truly in their profile of the people who can and will buy. Those that were 2s, 3s, and 4s, they typically couldn't get. We have some pending examples, two sevens and a five. Those sevens save a good chance, the five not so much. And when you work 
with different accounts, you need to be able to answer these questions about prospect identification and quantify them if you're going to succeed. Once that profile is identified, you need a great list. A high quality suspect list has to have all the standard demographic information that we talked about before, industry size, geography, but also needs to include the relevant titles for the type of business you're trying to write. HR, finance titles for benefits, risk managers, etc. for PNC, and if at all possible, procure emails that will assist you when you're developing your lead generation campaign. It's also important to use a cloud-based or very simple SFA or CRM. When I was an agent on the road all the time, I never updated our applied type systems like TAM or, or other similar systems because I was always in my car. So if I was in my office at 7 a.m. on a Friday and had just been on the road for four days, how was I going to catalog all the activities, calls, meetings, quotes, everything else that I had done over the week? I couldn't do it. So I'd put a few important follow-up calls in my Outlook calendar and then go back about my prospecting. It always fell down. Now I use a cloud-based CRM system where from my iPhone or my Android or my iPad or my laptop, or from Starbucks or wherever, I can quickly log a call I made, an email I sent. It's integrated with my Outlook so that appointments are cataloged as well, and it's very simple, so everything I do is cataloged, whereas before it was complex and cumbersome, so I never updated our system. The next thing is a lead handling process. This is also something that seems simple, but is extraordinarily important to a successful lead gen campaign because without it, a great producer with a great opportunity may still fail. And your lead handling process is going to be a little bit different, whether it's a telemarketing type lead or an email open or a webinar attendee like somebody on the line today. It also is important that you include exceptional, professional, e-collateral or an e-brochure. I have a quick image of a case study that I often send this talks about how we helped a wholesaler, a benefits wholesaler, expand their prospect universe and reach out and create new relationships. So when I talk to people in a similar profile, I share this case study with them to let them know that we understand what they're trying to do. So let's look at a sample process. At a glance, this looks very simple, but if you think about when you receive a lead, especially an externally generated telemarketing type lead, how many times do you actually work through every one of these steps? Probably not often, and that's a problem. This suggested process for a telemarketing type appointment is the day it comes in, send out a calendar invite. About two to three days before, send some type of collateral, like that e-brochure I mentioned a moment ago. The day before, or worst case, morning of, confirm that appointment via phone or email. Then, before the appointment, make sure that you do some additional research. Hopefully you'll get a great lead alert from your appointment setter, but by going to the website, to LinkedIn, other places like that, you can find more information to help you complete your list of prospect scorecard qualifiers so that you have an idea of how close this prospect really is to your perfect profile, and you can prepare a list of questions to fill out the rest of your scorecard while you're on the demo or the appointment. Last but not least, be prepared to execute that appointment with success. So these building blocks are in place. You know your profile. You know your process. How about your pitch? Tip number three today. Has your pitch truly been vetted? Has it covered all the keys to being an effective elevator pitch? Everybody has an idea of what they do and why it's important, but how well can you clearly articulate your value proposition? What are your top three differentiators? You specialize in contractors in St. Louis, but so does the agent down the street. You both have all the markets. You both have the world's greatest services. Why are you different? You both have safety and OSHA programs. Why are you better than him? Why are you different? Give me three reasons right now. These pitches need to be industry specific whenever possible, and you have to refine them constantly. Not after every phone call, not after every demo, but at least weekly or every couple weeks, you need to think about what are your differentiators, how have they changed, which ones work, which ones don't, and how can you make them better. It should also be tied in to whatever outbound lead gen programs you have going on. 
If you have a telemarketing program going, the keys from that telemarketing script need to be linked to the value proposition and differentiators that you use in your appointments and meetings. Same thing with email marketing. If the pitch in your um, meeting isn't linked to your outbound email message, there's going to be a disconnect with the prospect when you engage. A great way to test this, to go through the vetting process, is a friend or colleague test. Call a colleague who's not in the insurance business, or maybe even a colleague who's not a business person, and give them your pitch and see if they understand. Ask them to ask questions and see if they've grasped the concept, the value proposition, the differentiators that you've shared. Once all these are in place, it's time to start hitting the outbound. Appointment setting has always been and will be for at least a long time, the foreseeable future, the fastest path to the money in insurance, in other businesses, in my business. And the best way to fill the sales funnel is to make warm calls whenever possible. Warm calls we define as calling email opens or click-throughs, somebody who clicked through on an email campaign, a webinar registrant or attendee, somebody who commented on a blog, somebody who asked you a question in a LinkedIn group, people who have shown an interest in what you have to say, those are warm calls. Producers should only make those type of calls. They don't have time to make cold calls. They're closing, they're prospecting, they can't be cold calling. There's not enough hours in the day. However, cold calls can work. If you have a quality appointment setter with a verticalized pitch, industry specific or horizontal with a product specific, we have the greatest insurance program for manufacturers in the southeast. That would be a great vertical pitch. A great horizontal pitch might be we have the greatest benefits program for everybody with 250 to 500 employees in Texas. Those type of campaigns can still work. We execute those on behalf of clients all the time with great success. However, one important thing to think about is does your telemarketing provider offer territory exclusivity? If you have a great telemarketer calling the same account for two different people, you can't win. Both people will lose. So you need to have territory exclusivity when working with a telemarketing firm or appointment setting firm. Also, lead alerts are very important. How does the information arrive to you, the producer, and what does it contain? Let's look at a couple quick examples because this, in my opinion, is the most important email that you get when you have a telemarketing campaign campaign going. Here's a sample for a trucking account. We do a lot with trucking, very good at it, and so we always use these as, uh, as some of our examples. Here's an appointment scheduled Tuesday at 2 a.m. with John Smith owner. The name and contact information has, of course, been changed for privacy. But for any of you who work with trucking accounts, you can see how valuable this data is relative to a lead alert that just simply includes name, contact info, and the time that you're supposed to call or meet with the person. This prospect has 10 trucks. They mostly haul heavy equipment and lumber. Okay, The radius is the entire 48. Lower 48, that may change the markets that you're thinking about prior to the meeting. They have 13 employees and no, no, no owner operators. All right, So you don't have an owner operator hurdle to clear. Gathering information for a 5-1 renewal currently with Northland. So one of the big markets is out, but you know you have other high caliber markets available. You're scheduled to talk to them Tuesday at 10. So highly valuable information. There would actually be more personal detail included if we could share all of it. But this lead alert and the completeness of the information is critical to you completing your scorecard and to you succeeding in that initial meeting. So make sure the lead alerts that you get are full and detailed. Here's another one for a benefits account. Small trucking before. Now this is a big manufacturing account. It's an on-site appointment, Monday at 11. You're meeting with the VP of HR. You have both phone and cell. This account has 255 participating employees on the plan. Okay, so you have an idea of the market you're in. They're partially self-insured. That changes what markets, what programs you would talk about in the meeting. They've been with the same for broker for four years, some loyalty, but not married, and they're looking for expanded services and compliance assistance. So there's your opportunity. When you're working through your lead handling process, maybe you send a case study where you've helped an account like that deal with Papaka and Cobra challenges. Of course, contact information is critical. And when all these pieces come together, you can achieve results like this. This is a, a snapshot 
from a telemarketing campaign that we worked on through 15 weeks. Over that time period, just shy of four months, we made 4,300 calls. Producers can do that, but they won't, and they shouldn't. No producer should be spending this amount of time on the phone making outbound cold calls. That amounts to about 26 dials per hour, which is very hard to do. Um, we don't use auto dialers, but a professional caller with the right resources and in the right environment can make that many calls. They were able to schedule 122 conference call appointments. Those appointments, just by the end of this fourth month, yielded five deals and about 75000 in commission. And, of course, many um, of the prospects were still in the sales funnel, if you will, with quotes and sales pending. So these type of powerful results, massive ROI, they were only investing a couple thousand dollars a month with us, can be achieved when your vertical cold calling campaign integrates the right profile, the right lead handling process, the right pitch, and of course the right appointment setting tactics. In addition to appointment setting, we love email marketing. And Alan's going to talk to us a little bit about how to make email marketing an effective lead gen tool for your agency. So ultimately, the most effective marketing is when you're touching people in different ways. When you're reaching out and you're, you're interesting them in, as well as your vertical telemarketing pitch or your agency telemarketing pitch, you're also sending out email campaigns and e-collateral or fulfillment, and perhaps you're doing other things as well, like webinars, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about how email marketing can be a great and uh, addition, a great component to your overall lead generation strategy. Now, we send out, oh, I don't know, six, seven million emails per year now, B2B emails. And it, those are really fantastic for uh, example, for things like uh, educating prospects, letting them get to know you, doing things that are, are potentially helpful. Uh, to your prospective clients so that it's not just about selling insurance, it's also about showing them you're consultative. It's about developing your online rapport. Then when the phone call comes in, it's a warm call. John mentioned much better to do warm calling than it is cold calling, and for producers it should be imperative. Part of the reason is they're not probably going to be great at cold calling, and the second thing is they have other better things to do, and the third thing is they're compensated higher than a telemarketer would be, so ultimately we want to optimize the return on investment to the agency. We want to use the effective resource uh, in a way that optimizes your ROI. Now, when you talk about educational e-marketing, you want to make sure that you're, you're offering a call to action that, for example, uh, interests them in an educational way. So you might use a call to action like, join us for this educational webinar. Learn about Blink in, Blink in this in-depth case study. We have a new update on PAPACA regulations in this blog. Learn about this, uh, you know, experience mod factors in this two-minute video. Learn how to better ensure your restaurant for business interruption in this two-minute video. I, we have a new white paper on OSHA regulations and how it impacts your business. Here's an OSHA update, how to ensure OSHA compliance in 2013. PAPACA regulations in your 2013 renewal. All of these are great call to actions. They're the kind of thing that you want to send an emailing out about, whether it be a webinar or fulfillment. And fulfillment mean, a webinar is a type of fulfillment, but fulfillment means you're, you're providing something of value in return for them opening, reading, and paying attention to your email. Now, here's a sample call to action, a CTA. And this one is a webinar. So, for example, perhaps it's called the packet calculations for 2013, uh, or it could be CSA uh, hours of service regulations as uh, that would pertain to the trucking industry. How to integrate social media into your training initiatives. We did that for one of our training clients. Or today's topic, top five insurance agent lead generation topics, for example. Those are all good webinar topics. They're educationally centric. You're not just trying to sell somebody something. You're trying to help them learn about something, especially in related to your field of endeavor. A bad call to action would be, buy my insurance, I have the best rates, because they're going to hear that all the time. Buy from me, I have the best service. 
they're not going to learn anything by attending that webinar. Or they're not going to gain anything by opening up that email. Let's go to the next one. There's this concept that if it looks great in your screen, it's going to look great on theirs. I call that that WYSIWYG in reverse. So what you see may be what you get. What you see is what you get, WYSIWYG. But it's not necessarily what they get. So we strongly recommend to people they send at least a multi-part mime, but even then they don't use rich, graphically rich emails, uh, especially with large graphics at the top of the email, because then there's nothing that can be seen without a person trying to click on a red box or download something or display it differently or render it. So we we strongly recommend to people if you're doing complimentary email marketing that you limit the amount of graphics in the email and that you make it a business, a professional email interaction, whether it's a webinar or if it happens to be uh, email fulfillment. And remember, the, the most effective campaigns are the ones that integrate email marketing with telemarketing. Those are particularly effective because you have several ways of touching that prospective client and reaching out to them, not only your telemarketing pitch, as John mentioned, your, your elevator pitch, which has to be constantly refined and should roll off your tongue and should be extremely professional and highlight your differentiators, but also these educational emails that if you work with me, if you deal with me, you'll see that I I'm extremely knowledgeable in healthcare or trucking insurance or contractor based insurance, commercial insurance, P property and liability, PLI, etc. So, when we look at what can happen, here's a client with a large email database, 18,000. A huge would be, you know, 50 to 100,000. Small would be 1,000. Uh, they had 18,000 emails since 550 people registered for their webinar, 320 people attended, and they got 30 appointments. Absolutely fantastic. They did closed loop marketing, measuring what closed from this webinar, and they received over $300,000 of revenue. That didn't happen the day after, obviously. Uh, uh, you have to become, you know, write the business, broker, record letter, etc. but $300,000 from this campaign. And it didn't happen overnight. Email marketing and webinar marketing is a little bit longer than just straight appointment setting calls. Together, of course, they yield the best and fastest results of all. So is it all about the leads? Uh, there's a recent blog uh, that I wrote. Uh, it's, it's sort of a chicken and the egg blog, which talks about which comes first. Is it a successful producer or insurance agent leads? So, so that's the that's the age-old question. In other words, if you had a bunch of great leads and you hired a experienced producer, you should have a fantastic recipe for success. We know that there's a failure rate with new producers. They struggle to fill the pipeline and to have an effective close rate. So obviously, producers armed with in-profile leads are your fastest and best path to an increased book of business for both the producer and the agency. Our advice is allocate some amount of money for lead generation for your producers. It's sort of, we, we call it your sales insurance policy. In other words, just having the producer come in, even if it's an experienced producer, and say, great, now go dig up some business, that's, that's pretty difficult with all the other things that you want them to do. So use the right skills for the right job, have an effective lead generation process in place, have an effective lead handling process in place, have a great suspect list, and that is going to be your best path for success to increase your book of business. Now with that, I believe John has a poll for you, and we'll go into our Q&A. Yes, thank you, Alan, and I'm excited to go write some business now, but uh, we're about to launch a poll. During our Q&A, you can choose from any of these complimentary items that we're providing, a lead gen review, uh, a lead gen case study, or links to some of our lead gen-centric blogs. Um, I'll launch that poll in just one moment here. Okay, and hopefully you can see that on your screen. Feel free to answer at your leisure throughout the Q&A session. We have many questions that have come in. Um, the first one I'll pose to you, Alan, could you please elaborate on how to build an email prospect list? Great question. We get that all the time, by the way. 
Um, and, and frequently it's not just an email prospect list, it's, it's in general we don't have an up-to-date prospect list or we want to um, append or augment our prospect list. So invariably if you can't get off the phone today and say I have a fantastic prospect list, a suspect list is what we call it, I, I guarantee you I have at least 90% of the prospects in my universe. If you can't say that, that's the place to start. And there's a few things you can do. One there are services that will append your suspect list. You could take your suspects, uh, which would be name, company, phone number, email preferably as well, and go to a service and say, I'd like to have everybody meeting this criteria in the area, how many more contacts can I have? And you say my criteria is you know, C-suite, uh, risk manager, VP of HR, director of benefits, whomever you're targeting in whatever area, uh, Chicago, um, proximity of Chicago, Metro Chicago, all of Illinois, Indiana, Illinois, etc. The, uh, they will come back, we do this for clients all the time, they will come back and we will say you can have, uh, you can add 3,220 prospects or suspects to your existing list of 4,000, for example. And then you determine how many of those you want to procure. The goal is to have all suspects but as many emails as possible. So if 70% of those have emails, we want to add those emails. Even if you're not doing an email campaign today, your producers can send out individual emails, and in the future, you're probably going to want to start doing some type of email marketing. Thanks, Alan. The next question I'll handle, several people actually asked about the PowerPoint from today's presentation. And if anybody would like a copy of the slides, um, please feel free to call or email me when I close the poll. My contact info will be on the screen, and I'll send you a uh, PDF copy of the presentation. And we'll also be posting a recording of the web seminar to our YouTube channel, which you're welcome to view there. Um, next question we have is how do social media and SEO integrate with these lead gen programs that we've talked about today? Very important part of your ancillary strategy should be your SEO of social media and uh, you know, let's call it also blogging and e-publishing. They are a longer path to leads, however. Let me be perfectly clear. Our SEO is fantastic. If you type insurance agency SEO, insurance agency marketing, or you know any type of, of uh, long tail keyword like that, startup selling is going to come up number one. Sometimes we come up in the first two or three places. But it's a longer path, for, particularly for commercial. For what you want to, for, for the fastest path, you want to reach out to people in your profile who can and will buy. That's ideal. Reach right out to those people with your message. It's a push as opposed to, as opposed to a pull. Now, that said, given time and budget, you should definitely be working in the background on your search engine optimization and social media marketing. It, it, it helps. Um, helps in a variety of ways, including closing, that you have credible, unique content on the web. Uh, but I would do that as a secondary marketing method, not a primary. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you all for attending today. This is the conclusion of our presentation. As I said before, please feel free to reach out to me if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint or if you would like a lead gen strategy review. We thank you all for attending. We hope you have a great holiday season, and please be looking for our next web seminar invitation in the next few weeks where we'll talk about those topics that Alan was just discussing, web marketing, SEO, social media. We hope you all have a great day.